morning, Wellspring. How are you guys doing today? All right, a few of you are doing all right, the rest of you feeling a little sleepy. I don't know how that works, but it's good to see all of you guys. Glad that you're with us. I uh, want to welcome you uh, to, th- this is, this is kind of cool, like this is not only our first Easter in this building, but it's, it's the first time we've had Easter since all this was shut down. I want to especially welcome you guys. I remember last year, uh, I, I fairly famously said to our staff and all of that, listen, there's no way they're going to shut down churches for Easter. This thing will be over in a couple weeks. Just give it a couple weeks and we'll be past all this thing. And yet you guys are here for your second Easter online. We're just grateful to have you with us and grateful that you guys are here. I don't know about you, how you see this, but I just kind of, every year Easter is kind of like the end of winter to me. Like spring is here and people start cleaning out their garage and mowing their yard and doing the mulch and all that stuff. And so normally people have been cooped up for a couple of months and they get out and they start doing and I feel like this is going to be like an epic spring because everybody's been cooped up in a lot of ways for over a year now. And I think you're going to start seeing new life and all that. Easter's the kickoff for that. So I, I'm pretty excited about uh, Easter, not only because of the celebration of, of that, but more importantly, we, re- we serve a risen Savior. Jesus came, God in the flesh, came to earth, lived, taught us what it le- looks like to follow God, showed us what it looks like to, to be uh, a way of God, and then he died for our sins, endured terrible torture, and didn't stay in the ground. He, he conquered death, and three days later, he's up, he's up alive again, and we, we're here to celebrate that, which is very exciting uh, to me. As, as the video just showed you that our team put together, we're starting a new series today called Help My Unbelief. It's out of a, a, a story in the Gospels where Jesus is working with a man, talking with a man, and he said, do you have faith? He said, I, I do believe. I have faith. But help my unbelief, because you can believe and have unbelief at the same time. Like there's, there's this kernel of doubt inside of you. And Jesus was always meeting people who struggle with doubt. He was, he was always interacting with those who struggle with their faith. And I'm often surprised at how the church, his followers, his people, don't do that better. Because a lot of times when people come to church with their doubts and church with their, their lack of faith, they just get shame or judgment or, you know, looked down upon or whatever. And yet Jesus never did that. I mean, we're celebrating the greatest event in the history of the world. That not, God not only came into the earth, but he, he lived, he taught, he died, and he rose again. And some of, uh, some of us, a lot of us believe that, every bit of it. Some of us believe lots of it, but aren't sure about parts of it. Some of you aren't sure you believe any of that. And I want you to know, whichever one of those you find yourself in, you're not alone here. There's others just like you here. And I want you to feel welcome, because you are welcome here, and we're just super honored that you join us uh, on this special day. To get us all on the same page, I want to read one of the clearest passages about that moment, that Easter morning moment where the ladies went to the tomb and it was empty because he wasn't there. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I think it's fascinating that these hardened guards, soldier types, saw the presence of this angel and were just completely overwhelmed. It says the angel went to the women and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would. So come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. This is the reason for our faith. I mean, this is why we do what we do. We don't serve a, a God who gave us some good ideas and then now is gone. We serve a risen Savior who not only died for our sins, but, but conquered death, defeated death. It's the reason for the launch of the church 2,000 years ago. It's the reason we started Wellspring uh, 17 years ago. It's the reason that we celebrate every year at Easter that Jesus rose from the dead. They went to the tomb to anoint his dead corpse, and it wasn't there because he wasn't there, because he had risen just like he said. I want to go back, though, and look at the first verse we just read. Because there's a phrase there that if you've studied this verse before, you just kind of read over it. If, if, if not, maybe you didn't even catch it. But it's unusual to me, and I think we ought to look at it. Matthew 28, 1, we said, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Does that phrase seem weird to anybody else? 
Mary and the other Mary. It's, it's like, remember the New Heart show? New Heart fans, the old enough to remember Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. Is this like Mary and other Mary? And there's another, like, is this, is anybody else get confused by the number of Marys in the Bible? I don't know if anybody else does that or not. I've got a bachelor's degree in the Bible, and I still get confused on which, or is this the wife of Cleopas, or is this, I, I don't know who we're talking about. There's too many Marys. So I thought, as a gift to you, this is just free, as a gift to you, I thought, let me just explain the Marys so we can move on and have this clarified. So in the Bible, uh, you have Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's the famous one, right? So she's the one who conceived and was, gave birth to a son, and as Jesus there in Bethlehem, the whole Christmas story, all of that. You have Mary Magdalene. They, they called her Mary Magdalene because she was from a, a town called Magdala. And so there's so many Marys, we've got to diversify these somehow. So Mary Magdala, we'll call her that. There's Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Cleopas, uh, most scholars, when they study this, say that Cleopas and jo Joseph, Jesus' dad, were brothers. So Joseph and Cleopas both married women named Mary, because there's too many of them. There's Marys everywhere. So she both married a Mary, and that was Jesus' aunt and uncle, Mary and Cleopas. And very likely, they were the two in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. So when Jesus appeared to the two on the road, it was actually his aunt and uncle, very likely, which I think is just kind of a cool story. And then fourth, we have Mary of Bethany. She was the one who, Martha was her sister, Lazarus was her brother, and we'll talk about her story in just a minute. Now, there's actually two others in the New Testament. <laughs> there's too many of them, but I'm just going to focus on these four because four is enough uh, of Mary's to, to do it. Mary in the first century is a little bit like Amy today, like you can't swing a stick and not hit an Amy somewhere. Like there's an Amy around, uh, even now, somebody on your row is probably named Amy. My wife's named Amy. Uh, she grew up in Franklin. I, I, I've been tempted to call her Amy of Franklin, just to kind of clarify who she is. That may be an uh, easier way to look at that. I don't know. Uh, bo both of our next door neighbors, uh, the wives are both named Amy. I mean, there's just Amy's everywhere uh, in the church. And uh, it's kind of like Mary in the first century. There's just a lot of Mary's. So a friend of mine, Stan, and I met for uh, lunch a while back. He's a pastor also. And he, was, he and I were laughing about how there's so many Marys in the Bible, and it's just confusing. And, and you thought you were a dork. He and I were meeting at a restaurant actually talking about the Marys of the Bible. So it's worse than, you, you know, nerds. Anyway, so we're talking about this and just laughing about how many, there's so many of them, and it's just confusing, even people who study the Bible a lot, to keep track of all this. And he was telling me a couple of Easter's ago, he, he got so frustrated by it, he sat down and like charted it all out, tried to figure out who all the Marys were. And he landed on this fourth Mary, this Mary of Bethany. And he said, do you realize her story? And he started pulling out her story, because she only mentioned three times in the Bible. And he said, I think her story was designed to be significant. And he shared kind of the three stories. And I was like, oh my word. And at that moment, this is, this is a few, this is weeks ago, at that moment, I thought, this is the Easter message. Because I believe that Mary of Bethany's story and the way she interacted with Jesus is my story. And I believe that Mary is your story, and I would like for Mary to be some of your stories that maybe you're not sure what you believe, because I think her story is, is powerful. And so I, I just want to show it to you um, this morning, if we can. Now, she's only mentioned, as I said, three times in Scripture. Uh, she's mentioned in Luke chapter 10, and that was a couple of months before the crucifixion. Just to give you some context time-wise. Luke chapter 10 is a couple months before the crucifixion. John 11 is a couple weeks before the crucifixion, and John 12 is a couple days before the crucifixion. A couple months, a couple weeks, a couple days. Just to give you a context of where it's at. Those, those are the three times, and we'll, we'll show you more of that here in just a few minutes, all right? But I'm convinced that her story is powerful because the way she interacts with Jesus is kind of a guide, a guide book, a, a roadmap for us to, to look at as well. So the first time we read about Mary is in Luke chapter 10. Let me show you just kind of the cliff notes. Luke 10 says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. That's Mary's older sister. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So in just nut, nuts and bolts here, Mary's at the feet of Jesus. She's learning from him. And if you know the story, what happens next? Her sister Martha comes in and fusses at her. Do you remember this part of the story? She comes in and says, why am I back there doing all the dishes by myself? Why is she out here sitting here listening to you while I'm back there fixing meatloaf? Like, why isn't she out there helping me out? And so Martha comes out and fusses at Mary, and Jesus defends her. Do you remember this story? So at the feet of Jesus, learning from Jesus, Martha fusses at her, Jesus defends her. That's the first time we read about Mary. 
All right, the last time we read about Mary, stick with me. This is going to get good. Last time is in John chapter 12. This is, this is a few days before the crucifixion. John 12 says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served once again, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. Then Mary, this is the one we've been talking about, took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was, would later betray Jesus, objected and said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. So this is some really high-end perfume. This is not like the, the clearance section at Target. Like this is, this is some high-end stuff. He said, now Judas didn't say this because he cared about the poor. He didn't. But because he was a thief, he was embezzling money from the coffers. And as the keeper of the money bag, he used to keep to himself, help himself to what was put in it. So if a year's wages of perfume had been sold, he could have taken off some of that and siphoned that for himself. Verse 7 says, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor. You won't always have me. So now let's look at the parallels here. So in, in Luke 10... She's sitting at Jesus' feet. She's learning from Jesus. Martha fusses. Jesus defends her. Here in John chapter 12, she's at his feet again. This time she's worshiping him. She's wiping his feet with her, the perfume and her tears and wipe, drying it with her hair. This time Judas attacks her. Judas of all people. I think he's got enough to worry about on his own without worrying about her. Judas attacks her and Jesus once again defends her. Now, when you see that, if you're like me, all of a sudden the like, light bulbs start going off. Now, wait a minute. Both times there's a parallel. So what's in the middle? Because what's in the middle is probably the big thing, the big reveal for us to get to. And that's John chapter 11. So let me show you John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, that is funny to me. It's like John was saying, I know there's so many Marys. Let me, let me help you out here, okay? There's too many Marys. Let me get this narrowed down. This is the one that pours the perfume. Remember that? Okay, remember that story? Great. Tells her that story. It says, so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse 5. Now, J Jesus loved Martha, and he loved her sister, Mary, and he loved Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. It's weird. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And so on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, let's do the math here a second. If, he's, if he comes back to them after two days wait, and Lazarus has been in the grave for four days, if he had come back immediately, he wouldn't have been there when he's alive. He's going to be dead either way. So that's not why he waited, and it seems intentional. It's like Jesus wanted to wait to make, for emphasis, like he's really gone. He wasn't just sick. He's not just, you know, dead for a moment. Like he's really gone, four days in the grave. Verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. I love the, the honesty of this moment. So Jesus comes to, to meet with them. They've called for him because Lazarus is sick. Now Lazarus is dead, four days in the grave. They're weeping, they're grieving. Jesus comes to meet them. This is the same Mary who's at the feet of Jesus learning from him. The same Mary at the feet of Jesus worshiping him. But this time, Jesus walks up. Mary's hurt. She's confused. She's a little offended. And Martha says, let's go meet Jesus. And she's like, I got nothing to say to him. I don't, even, I don't even want to go talk to him. I mean, you go on and talk to him if you want to, but I'm going to stay here. I have nothing to say. It's a powerful moment. Mary's really frustrated. I also want you to notice the location here. John gives us the detail about Bethany, that Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Why does he tell us that? Why is that important? Because if you read through John, really all the Gospels, they only include certain things. There's not enough room to include every bit of the life of Jesus. It'd be far too much to include. So why, does they, why do they include this part and not the other part? In fact, John tells us why he includes certain things and not others. John 20 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which I didn't write down in this book. There wasn't enough room for that. I could have written a lot more stuff. I didn't write it down. But the things I have written down are so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
So John's very clear. As he's writing down all the events of Jesus, all the, the miracles, all the healings, all the, the, the wonderful signs, all the teachings, he was keeping and, and cutting out certain things based on, does this point people back to Jesus as the Messiah? If it does, I'm going to include it. If it doesn't, I, it, somebody else can tell it. I, I don't have room for it. I'm only going to include those essential things. So why does he include the bit about Bethany? Let's go, back to, let's go back to John 20, verse 20. Why does he include the bit about Bethany? It's because if John's whole focus is on how Jesus was arrested and crucified and rose from the dead, he's the son of God, then when you heal Lazarus, everything changes because you're so close to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like the epicenter for, for the religious leaders and the opposition to Jesus. It's where he was crucified. It's the centerpiece of the whole story. And Bethany being so close... When Lazarus is raised from the dead, all of a sudden everybody here hears about that. And it creates quite a stir. And now the religious leaders can't just say he's a good teacher. Do you see that? It's too close. They can't say he's just a good guy. He's a moral guy. He's a good teacher. He's got a lot of wise things to say. They can't say it anymore. Either they can say he's God and has authority over life and authority over death. He healed a man from the dead. Or they've got to say, he's a magician, he's making it up, he's a phony, let's kill him because we can't, we got to get him out of the way. And they had to come to a decision point. And I think John wants us to know that, the reader, because that's the same decision point we have to come to. You can't allow yourself to put Jesus in the good guy, good teacher category. It's not, he's, that's not available. He said he was God. He claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to have all authority in life and on death. And you can't just say he's a good guy. He's either God and he has authority over your life or he's just a fraud and let's move on. But you've got to come to a point of, you've got to come to a point of decision on that. And John wants you to realize that with the idea of Bethany. In fact, in John chapter 12, it points this out very clearly. It says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing. You can't just say he's a good guy anymore. He's either God or he's, he's a phony. Let's, let's figure it out. Because if he has authority over life and death, he's got authority over me. He's got authority over you. So Martha goes out to meet Jesus, and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She's, she's frustrated. I don't know about you. Does God, ever, does God ever do things in a different way than what you would have done them? Does God ever say certain things? And you're like, why did you say that? Or why, did you do, why didn't you come through for me like I thought you would? Martha's saying, God, if you'd have been here, Elijah wouldn't have died. But you wait around, and now he's dead. And she's frustrated. And, and Jesus and Martha have this pretty deep theological talk. It's like he gives her a little sermon about in times and resurrection and all this stuff. You can read it in John chapter 12. He gives this whole detailed thing. And it says after they've had this kind of conversation, after she said this to him, she went back and she called Mary over and said, the teacher, Jesus is here and he's asking for you. And he, she kind of gives her a guilt trip, like go out and see Jesus. He wants to see you. And so Mary reaches the place where Jesus was and she sees him. She falls at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's the same words that Martha had said. They'd been talking about this. They've been kind of fussing it to each other about why didn't Jesus do what we thought he would do? And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. And she, he said, where have you laid him? I, I want you to notice he approached Martha with her mind. He talked through theology. He didn't do that with Mary, even though she said the same thing. He, he appealed to her heart. And he just said, where, where's he at? And then he went with her. And they cried together at the graveside because he, he cared about both these women. And then John chapter 11 talks about how he went on to, to raise Lazarus from the dead. And because it's so close to Jerusalem, it created the stir. And really the countdown for his death had begun. And just a couple of weeks later, they arrest him. They brutally torture him. They put him on a, a cross. They kill him. They bury him in the ground. And on the third day, he wasn't there. He'd risen from the dead. It's a powerful story. Now, I don't know if you're this way or not. 
Um, I, I told somebody in between services when I was finishing high school and I was applying to colleges, I applied to a Bible college to be a minister. I also applied to an engineering school to be an engineer. And I kind of wrestled back and forth between the two. So when I see a story like this, I've got a chart in my head. That's just what, that's what happens to me. And I apologize if that's not you. But I got to show you my chart because I'm kind of, I'm not an artist, but I'm kind of proud of my chart. So let me show you this thing here. Uh, I'll click through this. So we have John, Luke chapter 10 and you have Mary is at the feet of Jesus and she's learning from Jesus. And then Martha rebukes her, and Jesus defends her. That's the story we told a minute ago, right? You also have John chapter 12, and she's at his feet worshiping him. She was rebuked by Judas, which is just ironic to me. Really, Judas, you got nothing better to do. Like, you should be apologizing to God, not, not fussing at somebody else. But sometimes people in churches who've got their own mess to deal with, they like to fuss at somebody else. You may have noticed that. Anyway, Judas rebukes her, and Jesus defends her, right? That's the story we looked at. So what about that middle one? That middle one is the key one. So, so Luke, John chapter 11, she's at his feet again, but this time she's not learning or worshiping. She's doubting. If you'd been here, my brother would be alive right now. Why didn't you come back? What's more important to you than healing my brother? Why aren't you here? God, why didn't you do the things that I thought you should do? And she's doubting. I don't even want to talk to him, she says. I got nothing to say to the man. Now, in this story, we don't see anybody fussing at her. So who, who rebukes her? The church has for years. The church has rebuked her for decades, centuries. The church has said, why didn't she have more faith? Why didn't she do better? Why didn't she believe in Jesus? He's going to heal her. Why did, why did she doubt? And I believe that Jesus defends her because Jesus always defends us. Jesus always defends us. I think it's interesting. Let me stop a second. I think it's interesting that Mary is pushed away by family Martha fusses at her. She's pushed away by the church. Judas, of all people, fuss at her. And then she's pushed away because she didn't, God didn't do what she thought he ought to do. And I, would, I don't know all your stories, but I would think if I scanned the room, we could find people in each of those categories. Some of you have had family, maybe even very religious family, who've kind of pushed you away by their actions. They say one thing, but they do something else. Some of you have had some Judases who want to get the attention off their own sin, and they'd like to focus on yours instead. And some of you have just been confused. Like, God, why didn't you do what I thought you would do? Why didn't you heal my kid? Or why didn't you heal my marriage? Or why didn't you heal my... Like, why didn't you do what I thought you should do? And so Mar Mary is pushed away by all three of those. And Jesus, time and again, defends her. So what does the church do in response to this? The church gives those who are wanting to learn, gives them square footage and industry. So we, we build education wings for people to learn about the Bible, people to learn about God. We have whole industries of book deals and curriculum deals. A lot of people in Nashville make their money creating curriculum and content for people wanting to learn about God. Those worship, same thing, square foot and industry. A lot, of, a lot of churches would call this a worship center where you come to worship God. And in Nashville especially, we have a whole worship industry of music and worship artists and all this stuff leading people in worship of God. The church gives those who want to learn and those who want to worship square foot and industry. So what does the church give those who doubt? They give them a lot of shame. They give them a lot of judgment. And honestly, what the church should be giving those people who are doubting is repentance. I'm sorry. If you're here and you've been pushed away by family or the church or by your doubts of God and you've not received a warm welcome like Jesus would have given you, the church didn't defend you like he would have, I'm sorry about that. You deserve better. We should have done better. And I'd like you to give us a chance to do better. You know, we, we started Wellspring not to have Christians who never have any doubts come together and polish their halos. We started Wellspring as a place for people with doubts to come and learn of Jesus and grow to worship in Jesus when they realize those doubts can be embraced and still be true. And I just want to say we're sorry about that. Now, speaking of confession, um, we were tr I was trying to figure out with my chart, how can I explain to the guys in back when to go to the next slide? And I, I wasn't sure how to do this. So this is not really a clicker. It's an old DVD remote from my house. It doesn't work at all, <laughs> but it's a way to point at the screen. And uh, so it doesn't do any good at all. But I thought that'd be helpful, right? Okay, so one more thing. John doesn't include everything in Scripture, right? He only includes certain things. So how much emphasis did John give to each of these stories? Those learning about Jesus, five verses. Mary worshiping Jesus, 
got eight verses, but Mary's doubts got 44 verses. Which one does he want to make sure you catch? Which one does he want to make sure you catch? He wrote his whole gospel to point you to Jesus the Messiah, and he understands there's some people with doubts who need a few extra verses to work this through. And I just want you to know we want to come alongside you if that's you. So what do you do? If this is your story, what do you do? I think, I think this is a good roadmap for you, actually. I want to encourage you to learn of Jesus. If you know who God is and you follow God, then that's great. Make learning about God a high priority. If you're not sure about all this and you've got some doubts, make learning about God your highest priority. I'd encourage you to, to come back to church. In fact, this whole series, these next four weeks, is all about helping you in your unbelief. And if you've got some unbelief, if you've got some doubts, we want to help you work through those things. What you can't do is what many of us in our culture do, is make religion and Christianity somewhat important. Logically, that's not an option. In fact, C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance at all. But if true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. Don't let learning about God be moderately important in your life. Either he's God or he's a phony. Either he rose from the dead or his body is decomposed long ago in a Middle East tomb. That's the only options you got. And like the, like the religious leaders, when they saw Lazarus risen from the dead so close to Jerusalem, they no longer had the choice of saying, he's just a good guy who teaches wise things. That's not an option. Either he's God or he's not. And you've got to learn and dig and, and decide those things for yourself. If it's true, if the God of the universe sent his son into the world to die for my sins, to die for your sins, then that's the most important thing that you can study these days. Nothing more important to give your life to. In fact, I, I want to say to you, if, if, you if, if Jesus is not real, like if he was a guy who taught some wise things and some people made up some stories about him to make him sound better than he was and they buried him and stole his body or something crazy. If he's not real, if he's not God, then you guys are on the front row watching somebody waste his life. Because I've built my whole life around the idea that this is true. And if it's not true, if he's a con artist, then, then you're witnessing, front row, real time, somebody wasting his life. But if it is true, if it is true, and I believe it's true, if he came and lived and died and rose again from the dead, and you believe that, but don't give it due attention, then you're going to get to the end of your life with your own set of regrets. You're going to wonder, why did I spend so much time on my career and money and finance and building a better house and getting Instagram likes or something nonsense crazy? It's going to be such a waste of time because the Son of God came into the world and lived and taught and died and rose from the dead and I sort of gave it some moderate attention. You're going to be very regretful of that. And if you don't ever give your life to Christ because you're just not sure it's worth investigating, you're going to get to the end of your life and not be able to cross over into death with peace. And you're going to be forever wishing, as you're apart from God, that you had given it more time, more attention. So follow Mary's lead and learn from Jesus. In fact, this whole series is going to be designed for you. Second, I want you to embrace your doubts. You know, maybe like Martha, your doubts are about intellect, and you've got a, a question about some of the details or when it was written. or how. The, if, if you've got those questions, you send those in. I'd love to see those. I'll, I'll build those questions into the series. I won't even quote you. I'll just be anonymous. But I'll build those into the series, and we'll deal with those. Or you and I can meet for coffee or something. That'd be great. Uh, maybe it's intellect for you. But maybe like Mary, it's not intellectual at all. Mary was pushed away because of family drama. Mary was pushed away because of church drama. Mary's pushed away because God didn't do what she thought God ought to do. So maybe he's not real. And I know every, every one of those is in this room. And if that's you, I want you to know that God sees you. And he cares. And he loves you. So I want you to embrace the doubts. Mary learned, and then she embraced her doubts. And as you learn about God and you have these doubts crop up, I want you to embrace the doubts. Because you've got to come to a point where either he rose from the dead and he's the God of the universe or he's a phony. And, and that's really the options you got. So if you've got some uncertainty, you know, the, the technical term is agnosticism. That's great. Uncertain about us. Wrestle with that. Embrace those doubts. 
But then you've got to come to a point of decision. In fact, this is the one place Richard Dawkins and I, a famous atheist, probably agree. Dawkins said temporary agnosticism is an entirely reasonable position, but permanent agnosticism is fence-sitting and intellectual cowardice. And if that's you, you've got to embrace your doubts. Wrestle through with that. Come to a place of decision. It's either the most important thing in the world or it's of no importance at all. And you've got to come to that decision. You know, back in 1969, there was a great moment in not just American history, but world history where uh, a man landed on the moon, right? Some of you uh, saw, remember that. Some of you are, are too young to remember it in real time, but you've read about it or whatever. And, and the big moment was he's standing there in the ladder and he says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then Houston goes crazy and he steps off. And the next words that weren't recorded, because you couldn't hear them very well, because of all the excitement in Houston, the next words he said was, it's solid. Now, what's he talking about? Well, they didn't know what the consistency of the moon would be. I mean, no one had ever been there. They didn't know what it was going to be like. And they knew how much space dust flew through the atmosphere, and they knew all of this kind of stuff, and they'd done all these calculations, and they said, maybe you're going to step off and sink in all the way up to your, like you're just going to sink in this dust. Or maybe you're going to step up and be like waist deep in this dust. Or maybe you're going to, and they didn't know. And there's a lot of fear and a lot of discussion, a lot of studies. And so he says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And he stepped off and he said, it's solid. And he stood on the moon. And I want you to know as you're wrestling with your doubts, the Christian faith is solid. God's not scared of your doubts. Ask him. Embrace those. Dig into it. If truth is there, you're going to find it. You don't need to run from it. Embrace it. I have built my life on the, it's solid. You can trust it. So do as Mary did. Learn from God, embrace your doubts, and then worship God. I mean, if you learn about God and then worship, if you, if you don't learn about Jesus, you're not going to be able to worship him. So do that first. If you try to learn and then skip over your doubts and go straight to worship, it's probably going to hollow out the process. You've got to work through those doubts But if you learn about God and then embrace your doubts, you're going to come to a place where you can worship him because you're going to realize, as I have, that it's true. Jesus came, faced unbelievable torture. He faced ridicule. He died for our sins. But on the third day, he rose again. When they went to anoint his body, it wasn't there. He wasn't there because he had risen. And in response, Mary said what you would logically say, that he's worth the very best that I've got. So she pulls out her perfume, her prized possession, and pours that on his feet. You've got something worth far more than perfume. God wants your life. He wants your heart. He wants your devotion. He wants your friendship. And if you've worked about God to learn about God, and you've come work through your doubts, then, then give him the very best that you have, your, your heart, your life, your, your devotion, your friendship. It's what he's wanting from you. You know, I, I really need you to know we're going to take a moment to worship here together. For those who are Christians, this is a time for you to celebrate what God has done. For those of you with doubts, this is a time to kind of maybe wrestle and and consider what God has done for you. But let me make sure you're clear on something. You're not surrounded by people who have never had doubts. There may be churches like that. This is not the one you found. You're surrounded by doubters who have learned enough, who have embraced their doubts enough to realize that he's He's real, he's true, in sunny days and in the darkest nights. And they've wrestled with it. And you're at home in a a family of people who understand doubts. And they care about you. And God cares about you and he wants your heart. Why don't you bow your head and let me pray for you and then we can sing this prayer together. Dear God, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you handle my doubts better than the churches sometimes do. That we can learn from you. We can worship you, but we can also have our doubts. And we don't need to hide, and we don't need to pretend, and we don't need to fake. We can embrace them, and we can bring them to you. Because you're true, and you're real, and you have nothing to hide. And God, I thank you that you not only sent us information from heaven. You didn't just teach us what it means to follow you. You didn't just sit back with folded arms and a shameful look at at the mess we've made of this earth, but you came. You sent your son to to not only live and teach and and love, but to, to die for my sins, not his. And then you conquered the only thing that couldn't be conquered in death. For me, 
so that you and I could be in relationship together. And God, I pray that I would use every moment of this life all the way up to the point of my death to thank you and honor you for the goodness you've shown to me. I'm grateful, God. I pray in Jesus' name.